Hello, and welcome to the second part of a 10-part series we're calling Emotions and the Aging Process. I'm Naomi Arenberg, very happy to be back with you and with Dr. Ron Sepatelli, who's Naomi. here to discuss <clears throat> that whole, I'm going to call it a ball of wax, because you'll be melting it down for us during this 10-part series to give all of us some advice about how to better live out our last years, which now are stretching into the decades. There are people who are living past retirement for 20, 30 years, and how to be fulfilled family members and friends and caretakers. That's right. So in the last segment, our first segment in this series, you talked about a couple of key points. One was receptive listening. Can you recap what that means? Sure, Naomi. Uh, <clears throat> what receptive listening is, is when we, the, the, the listener, is receptive to what the speaker is saying. Now, how do we know where, where we're being receptive? We know we're being receptive by what the speaker says back to us after we speak. Okay? And what we tend to do when we're, if we're receptive is that we reflect what the person has been talking about or we join what the person has been talking about. For example, if someone is angry and they're talking about angry things in their life, uh, uh, the person is angry, correct? So uh, to be receptive, I may say that's infuriating. So I'm receptive to what that person is saying. And you may say, oh, well, what does that mean? Well, what that does, it gives the uh, person opportunity to say more. Okay, versus say, don't be angry, okay? Mm -hmm. It's shutting mm -hmm. them off. So I am essentially joining, I am joining the speaker in their emotions. I think there are some people who would say you're giving that person a safe place to express what he or she is feeling. Absolutely, that's absolutely correct. You gave one example <clears throat> at the end of our last segment about a patient named Mary who had been hallucin hallucinating, who complained constantly during all of her waking hours, particularly about the food, and it also took the staff all day, the staff in a top-notch facility, mm -hmm. to get her to swallow her medication because Correct. she was physically unable to swallow medication, although she could swallow food. Correct. You happened to be at this facility one day when she was hallucinating. A nurse came to report to, I guess, to you and the medical director. Mm -hmm. So you were brought along to her bedside, mm -hmm. And you began a conversation with her. You demonstrated that as receptive listening. What happened your, when your first meeting at Mary's bedside? Okay. Well, one thing I'd like to just uh, mention is that this case of Mary, what it's going to show is that our drive to live lasts our entire life, actually right up until the day she died. So uh, maybe it was a week later, I went uh, in her... Uh, Actually, back up for just a moment. <clears throat> Recap what you said to Mary and how that demonstrated receptive listening. Okay. So what happened uh, that first day when after the doctor tried to you know, orient her, uh, he asked me if I would say something, uh, if I wanted to say anything. So I, I bent down near her and I said to her, uh, who's tied your legs up? Okay. Because that's what she was screaming she was, about. She was screaming. They're trying to. They tied my legs up. They're trying to drown me, and so forth. And she says, "My mother and him. My mother and him." And you know, then she stopped and said, "Who are you?" To you. Yeah, to me. All right. So I explained who I was, and so forth. And she said something like, "You have a soft voice, or a nice voice, or something like that." And so I knew there was a connection there. Okay, there was a positive connection. So I knew I, I could probably work with her. And that she was actually lucid enough. Correct. Or as you were saying, right. in some kind of in between state. Right. She might have been hallucinating, but she wasn't completely in a right. state of hallucination. Right. Well, when people are confused and so forth, you know, I, I know the, the protocol is to orient people and so forth, which is fine. But if I can ask them a question, if I can ask you a question, I'm going to ask you a question about something and you answer my question, I know there's another person in your life. You're not totally of psychotic, because you can think of something I said. So that's what I did with her. And that's a way of orienting people. And actually, we can assess someone. In our work, we can continually assess a patient uh, the whole time we're working with them. So you're providing her with a receptive listener, mm -hmm. with genuine ears to hear mm -hmm. her, and you're getting some information back about her. Correct. It's Correct. 
It's an ongoing assessment the entire time I work with someone, the entire time I'm assessing them. <clears throat> so what was that first encounter with Mary like? Okay, well, uh, it was interesting. So I, I, she was in bed in her room, and I pulled up a chair, and I sat down by her, and I introduced myself, and off she went. She just started talking uh, about... Uh, Frank Sinatra and Mae West and singers and... So uh, did you think she was hallucinating <clears throat> at that point or she was in her own world, her own reality? I did or was she, Well, it's an interesting question you ask. I wasn't sure, okay? Uh, so she's talking about all these things and she'd be, it was tangential. So then she'd say, start complaining about food. And she'd say things like, I used to eat steak, and I, <laughs> I used to have lobster, and now this stuff, there, you know, that's not real food. I used to get all this good food. And, so and this is in a top-notch facility yeah. where... She's getting good food. Okay. okay. She's getting good food. So, this, you know, so I know that, that, that her complaints are really not about what's going on now. But what's going on now is giving her, in, in a sense, the stage to complain about it. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, now, I've got to figure out if she does really know I'm here. So she goes on talking and talking, and then what I would do each session at the beginning, one or two times, I would either ask her a question, like, um, what was the food this morning, mm -hmm. okay? Or I would join her in the sense of saying, if she was complaining about the food, oh, that's disappointing, or something like that, and see if she responded to me. Mm. So when I'd say she's disappointed, she would say, oh, of course, oh, yes, it is, and on, she would talk about something else. That's called progressive communication. When you make an intervention, a statement, uh, a comment to someone, and they then add more information, talk about something more, then you know that your intervention was positive. Okay. So, so she's choosing to further that conversation. Correct. That the jumping off point was a complaint yeah. about, you know, my egg was rubbery, yeah. for example. And Dr. Sepatelli says, well, that must have been disappointing. Yeah. And then Mary says, yeah, and there was too much salt on it. Uh, or she may even start talking about something else. So what I did is I joined her emotion, okay? And I, I essentially took care of that emotion for her. Mm -hmm. okay. So why isn't anyone else doing this in the facility? Well, first of all, I, I, you know, they don't know how to do it. Like you have to learn how to do this. And uh, secondly, they're very busy people. Very busy people. So, so that was how the first several sessions went. Now, she was in bed in her uh, uh, pajamas, okay? So what I had to do was to really get her in a, I had to kind of train her, okay, to get her to start moving forward. So after a couple of sessions uh, meeting with her while she was in bed, I asked the staff if she could be in a wheelchair the next week. But so still in pajamas. She was still in pajamas the next week. And then I asked the week after, could she have some clothes on? And that was very interesting. Not only did she start wearing her clothes, but her family went out and started buying her suits. And from about the fifth session on, every single time I met her, except for a few times when she was sick, she had a beautiful suit on. No kidding. Yes. So she liked doing that. She liked getting dressed. Absolutely. Then what was stopping her before? Well, she didn't want to be in the nursing home. Oh, okay. So she was sort of emotionally checking out. Uh, trying to emotionally mm -hmm. checking out, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So then about the fifth session, uh, she was in a wheelchair. I walk in one day and she goes, oh my gosh, you've got white hair. <laughs> it's not black like Sinatra. <laughs> so what did that mean? Her eyes were open. Yeah. So her eyes so were her open. eyes had been shut. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. So over time she explained to me, and I will tell you this now, uh, why her eyes were shut. They were shut for several reasons. One is she didn't want to be in a nursing home. Okay? She wanted to be home. But the second thing, and it's something that I've heard many times her nursing home residents, is she didn't like looking at old people. I'm speechless because that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. In our culture, sure. th there are negative connotations to certainly looking old. Yeah. Yes. So th I think that's a whole subject for another Correct. entire conversation mm -hmm. that you and I are not going to change <clears throat> through receptive listening mm -hmm. 
or anything else because it's a, the culture is bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. But we can try and make a dent through yes. the yeah. kinds of therapeutic techniques that you're talking about. Yeah. Sure. Why did she open her eyes? Well, uh, you know, she had a positive... Uh, uh, as we call our field transference towards me, okay? So she wanted to see me, okay? She felt good talking to me. I didn't challenge anything. I didn't judge her. I didn't value anything. I just sat there and listened and made these few comments. And apparently, even though you have white hair, she kept talking with you Yes. for some oh, years? Yes, you... six years. I worked with her for six years. Yeah. So you got the... This sounds like a milestone. So you've got her progressing inching along mm -hmm. into the clothing, into sitting up with you. Mm -hmm. She's got her eyes open. Mm -hmm. Sounds as though you're in a whole new phase of Correct. therapy. Yep. Then uh, after that, we went and we met in a certain room, this private room after that, because originally she had a roommate and we first started. Mm. Obviously, you don't want to be around that. And so we met in this private room um, each week for the rest of the time we were together. Tell us how she progressed. So she's got okay. her eyes open. Did she okay. keep them open? Oh, yeah. Did she keep them open with the staff? Uh, interestingly, she didn't do it right away with the staff, but uh, probably several weeks later she did it, you know, uh, with them, yeah. How did they respond? Uh, you know, positively. Oh, yeah, positively. Uh, and obviously her, um, her family really liked her talking to me because the family had been uh, kind of arguing with the nursing home, kind of blaming the nursing home for her mother's problems, okay, which is an understandable thing, which, you know, um, uh, you know, it really has not a lot of basis to it, but understand what happens fairly often. Okay? Well, sure, but if they wanted, it shows on the positive side that the family cared. The mm -hmm. family wanted yeah. to be able to help yeah. and get Mary into a good situation for right. her, a nurturing situation. Yes. Yes. And their only, um, all they had to go by was her complaining. Yeah. Correct. In terms of what should be changed, well, right. the nursing home should be changed. Yeah. And they're trying to okay. They're trying to brush her teeth better. They're trying all these things. They're asking her all these questions. What should we do? This should we do that? How's this and how's that? Okay, which is, which is very understandable and normal. But the one thing they weren't doing was listening to her. Okay, now I'm not criticizing them when I say that. Okay, you understand? Yes, 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 yes. We've established that she was in a top-notch. Yeah. facility, yep. and she has a caring family. Yes, absolutely. Go back to Sinatra. <laughs> well, uh, yes, so, I'll, uh, so what she did a lot of was talk about uh, actors, actresses, Sinatra, the Rack Pack, a lot in our sessions as we went along. That, and what, can you give us an example? Because it's not something I do or I've heard. If I sat down to talk with you, I wouldn't start by saying, did you see that session with the Rat Pack on TV in, in 1963? So uh, it sounds as though she was, first of all, sharing something extremely important to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did the conversations like that go? Well, those conversations were basically one-sided. She would choose to do... You know, now, uh, when you understand, when I sat with her, each, I'd sat with, sit, sit down with her, okay, at first I would start with something like, what are you thinking, or how should we start, or something like that. But after we got going, I, I, would, I would just sit down and she would just start. She would just no start talking. No kidding. Yeah. Not complaining about the food. Well, she complained about the food for a long time. She complained about food for a long time. She complained about a lot of things for a long time. And... Uh, what she did, she explained her life mm -hmm. and how she grew up and uh, essentially this is uh, her life was uh, her parents were uh, very, very wealthy and uh, her father was an alcoholic, her father, her mother either had some psychological problems or was fighting with the father. She described a lot of fighting and kind of crazy behaviors with her parents as a young child, and her father died young. They got divorced, and then they died young. And she had some uh, very traumatic things happen to her mm. when she was a young uh, or a teenager and a, a young woman. And then not only did these traumas happen to her, she then had to take some actions which, uh, f which traumatized her more. So and can, stuff she had tremendous amount of shame for her whole Can life. you share with us what happened to her? Uh, I wouldn't, I don't think I want to share that. Sure. Uh, people can um, imagine what might happen to a, a young woman. Um, you know, 
uh, out in life. And uh, then she had to react to that. And so I'll explain one thing. I'll actually explain it all. So all these behaviors that she was having, not swallowing the medications, complaining about her teeth, and so forth, were all directly related. Now what happens is you and I, we have a life. Things have happened to us in the past. Uh, you know, if our parents didn't you know, buy us the right bike and we might be mad at them for that and so forth. But we're moving on. We're preparing for the show and so forth. We have a lot of things we're thinking about all the time. Mm -hmm. When someone is in a nursing home and they have had a stroke and they're partially dementia, there's no thinking about the future. There's mm. very little thinking about the future. So then the feelings you've had in the past, that stuff bubbles up. Mm -hmm. Things that we've been defending against, we've kept them repressed, okay, let's say. So this is what often happens with behaviors in nursing homes. So when she was a teenager, she had this traumatic event, and then she said something that was very shameful to herself. So she tried to kill herself. She mm -hmm. ran in front of a car. She was hit, knocked down, and one of the things that happened to her was she broke a tooth. So she told me that as long as she always took tremendous care of her teeth. And so she wouldn't think of what happened. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. And the same involved with the medications. So after it took about two years, she explained that. She said to me one day. Wait, it took two years? She's very, very slow, and she didn't just come out and tell me a story. Okay, it was very deliberate parts of it, and she may, she may talk about something, part of one something, and then a month later say, you know, okay, now I want to continue from when I told you about this. So she's making progress, and I understand Mary is no longer alive. She was 88 when he first started yep. working yep. with her. Yep. And what's her <clears throat> next phase of progress? Okay, so her being a her being able to say all these, these things to me, okay, and her having a, a, a positive feeling towards me, okay, she started getting to the better parts of herself, self, parts of herself that was suppressed her entire life. And she then started singing. There was a band that played once a month at the nursing home. It was a piano player and a guitar or something, a accordion. And so she decided she wanted to sing a song there one day. So she uh, learned one of, us, one of uh, Sinatra's songs or somebody's songs, and she sang this song with the band. And that just took over her life. She started, her family bought her all types of CDs, and she just remembered song, uh, song and she would, she was, the, and, and the staff would talk about what a star she was, and she would just belt these songs So this up. is the same Mary. Same Mary. It sounds as though, I was going to say, you kind of had a brain transplant. But even better, she didn't have the brain transplant. Correct. She had a way of conversing for several, yes. a number of years. Yeah, yeah. It took several years, <clears throat> and then she became a singer. Yeah. And I understand a jokester. Oh yes, she was. She would tell jokes all the time. Some even off color. Okay, uh, and that's uh, not only did she talk about having different relationships with the staff. But the staff would mention to me, oh my God, Mary, what a hot ticket, what a character, and so forth and so forth. The same people that were complaining about her two years earlier. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Were you with her close to her death? I was. Um, so what happened uh, as she went on uh, in about the uh, last several months of her life, her family actually started paying for her to have singing lessons, professional singing lessons. And she really was excited about that. So I went, uh, walked into the nursing home one day to see her, and then someone said, Mary's uh, probably can't do it. She can't. She can barely. She had uh, chronic heart failure or something. Mm. She can barely breathe. She probably won't see you. So I kind of walked quietly into her room, and I, she had the sides up on the bed, and I kind of bent over, and I said, good morning. And she said, oh, oh, it's you. Oh, uh, I've got to talk to you. I've got to talk. Now, she said this in a very quiet voice and with pauses and so forth. She said, I couldn't wait to tell you. She says, you know, my uh, music teacher, she says, you know what my music teacher said to me? She said that I have potential. She said, me, someone who's depressed and did nothing her whole life, I have potential. She said, I can see myself in Caesar's Palace doing uh, Dean Martin's routine, and she tells this joke that Dean Martin says, okay? And she said, I can't wait. And she says, you know, I know that's silly. 
So she says that yeah. Mary knows it's silly. Yeah, she says, I know, that, I know that's silly. But you know, it's so wonderful to think about it. She says, you know, this is the happiest time of my life. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And she died six days later. <clears throat> so she had this drive to live right up to the end. You've, of course, <clears throat> encountered people who didn't have that drive. Yeah. Sometimes in person and sometimes through your reading. Yes. Yes, so uh, it's interesting, you know, um, I live in Vermont where they have assisted suicide now. Mm. Okay. So there's been talk about that and so forth. Uh, but uh, recently, I'm going to give you kind of a contrasting example of two people. I read an article, and this was in another assisted suicide state. I believe it was uh, Oregon. I think Oregon is assisted suicide. <clears throat> uh, on a Friday, a hunter was in a tree. He fell down, and he broke his neck. So they took him to the hospital. And uh, on Saturday, he was put on a ventilator, and they had him in an induced coma. His family came to see him, and this is uh, something that was in the paper, okay? And his sister said, oh, he said that he would never want to live in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to wake him up and let him, I think I know what he's going to want to do. Mm -hmm. So they woke him up from the induced suicide, and they said in he was... Induced in coma. Induced coma, induced coma, sorry. And they asked him... Um, if uh, that he was gonna, uh, said he was going to live in a wheelchair, exactly how it was done, I don't know. I wasn't there, and that he was going to. So live you've just read this in the paper. Yes. This is not yeah. a client of yours. No, right, right. And um, they, he said, I, "No, I don't want to live in a wheelchair." So they took him off the ventilators, and he died five hours later. <clears throat> okay, so this is one option that people have. Mm -hmm. Now another option is a man named John Rackley. Um, now I don't know if people. I was going to say it. The name's a bit familiar, but do go on. Yes. Uh, John is one of the most amazing human beings I have ever met. Uh, he is someone who broke his neck uh, on a trampoline accident. <gasps> <clears throat> he, was, uh, uh, he, was, he was like the two jumps. He was trying to show someone how to use the trampoline. As a grown-up, not as a, as a child. He was like 34 years old. I think it was 17 years ago it happened. And he broke his neck, and he's what's called an incomplete quadriplegic. Oh, it sounds so awful. So he's essentially from the chest down. He's paralyzed, but he can move. He can move his arms. He can move his arm. And he can close one hand. Mm. Okay. So uh, John, uh, he told me that before his injury, he thought he would never live in a wheelchair. That he was a he was a avid hunter and fisherman. And he was and trampoline artist and trampoline artist, and he was a weightlifter and all these things. And of course, that ended one day with that. So, uh, what happened? So he was, um, uh, you know, obviously you know, paralyzed. He was home, and about a year later, uh, some friends of his came over to visit him, and they were hunters, and they talked about a deer they got. And he thought they shot that deer where I hunt. If I was out there, I could have got the, that deer. So he decided then that he was going to be out there hunting next year. No kidding. Yes. So John Rackley has invented over 50 things uh, for quadriplegics involving wheelchairs and other things. So, so he not only got himself <coughs> out, mm -hmm. he's helping other people. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, he has a, uh, there's a site you want to uh, go to. It's called Renegade Wheelchairs. You go to that site, you can, or just Google John Rackley, and you will see articles of one of the most amazing human beings uh, ever, ever. Now, he hunts. He caught a 202-pound deer. He went out by himself, shot a 202-pound deer, and dragged it in by himself <gasps> with his wheelchair. What a remarkable man. Yes, yeah. It sounds like a privilege. Well, interesting what to, he said. He yeah. said, you know, I'd like to be whole again, obviously, but you know, if I didn't have this injury, I would not be living the life I live now. That's a fantastic insight. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to hear more about John in the next segment, which is segment three of our series, Emotions and the Aging Process. But first, let's remind everyone who's with us that we would like your questions and your responses to John, to the man who fell out of the tree, to Mary, to Dr. Ron Sepatelli. If you look at your screen, You'll be able to see a website to go to and an email address where you can and an email address where you can contact us as well as a telephone number. Dr. Sapatella, you have a lot more to say about John, John Rackley, 
and, um, and about receptive listening and other aspects of your practice and the kinds of advice you can give people as 10,000 people a day enter age, beyond age 65 <clears throat> in this country alone. What else can we say to, uh, to close out this session? Well, I'd like to say, first of all, that I'm, I'm a very privileged man to be able to work with the people that I've worked with. Uh, I, I work in a rehab unit, I work in acute units in hospital, and I meet some of the most amazing people in the world. I've met professional athletes and people who have uh, built things that if I could say what they did, everyone l listening would know who it was. And I can just sit there and listen to them tell their story. It is it's, a privilege. It's a privilege. Now, actually, here's a question that we've received already. <clears throat> I nearly <clears throat> forgot about it. From a woman who says, my husband is in a nursing home. I'm still at home and I feel guilty. Mm. Is this something you've heard before? Oh, yes. This is fairly common. This is quite common. So, uh, um, uh, fairly common, I should say. So what happens, let's say, in a marriage, okay? In a marriage, we have to uh, compromise, right? We have to do, you know, you can't have everything you want, you know, even though we want to have everything our own way. Uh, so... What happens in some marriages is that one partner compromises more than the other. And when I hear this and the people that I've worked with this, what you find out is that um, the partner home tended to compromise more. So now that the one is in a nursing home, the one at home is enjoying their life a lot much better. And if, okay, for example, I knew a woman who was dragging her husband around in a chair in the house. Mm. And finally, a nurse came in one day to see him and said, what's going on here, okay? And anyway, he ended up in, in a nursing home, and she uh, um, was home, uh, you know, and all of a sudden she got a new wardrobe, makeup, and was actually taking trips, buying gold change and so forth. So here's a case where, you know, once the husband wasn't there, she could kind of be more herself, and then they feel guilty about that. Mm. So what do you do? We have only a few seconds. Perhaps we should give a more complete answer to this, this common question in the next segment. Absolutely. Yes. What a great question. Thank you. All right. Dr. Ron Sepatelli, and thank you, our viewers, so much for being with us. We'll see you next time for segment three in Emotions and the Aging Process.